All right, everyone. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the premise here. Uh, I have this uh, moment in time in which I'm actually independent. So here we go. Uh, but I do have some sort of a basis. <laughs> I do have some sort of a basis to comment on uh, industry trends, uh, those that you know, everyone talks about, the things that the bloggers and the investors and the analysts kind of insist are uh, the things that we should be paying attention to. And um, you know, I've, a lot of people, when they're inside, the, inside, the, uh, inside companies, they have to kind of speak with their corporate interests in mind. And I think a lot of the talks here have done that. Now, true, a lot of people select careers and select jobs that are compatible with their direction, which is uh, what I did in working at Funzio. They had a very strong multi-platform focus uh, back, and, and they started when everyone was talking about just Facebook. You know, you need to just be on Facebook. And so they were one of the first ones to go into uh, mobile. And now that everyone is mobile, they're still holding on to social. Uh, they have a very kind of long-term view, and it was something that I found very compatible. Prior to that, I w did business development for electronic arts. Um, I just saw uh, Michael Chang enter the room, so uh, he was someone that, he is, he's still there, uh, bless his soul, uh, working on corporate development, so his job was to uh, find uh, studios to acquire. My job, job was to uh, um, sign deals with them. So uh, this was something that was also compatible with my thought process about the game industry in finding um, great talent, finding really amazing people, great game ideas to uh, uh, supply EA's marketing and uh, publishing power too. So that was something that was incredibly uh, uh, useful and um, uh, valuable to everyone in the industry. And then, you know, other stuff in the background is, uh, you know, I, I was uh, involved with the Game Developers Conference, uh, a Game Developer Magazine, uh, a little industry blog called samofos.com, and uh, a science fiction novel called Tearing the Sky. Uh, uh, I am working on another one, but it's uh, not a sequel. Sorry about that. So stuff we're going to cover in what I guess is now uh, 16 minutes is looking at everything from a social mobile uh, free-to-play standpoint. You know, the virtual goods, this kind of overall bucket that uh, we, we inhabit at Casual Connect. I see a couple of uh, uh, traditional game industry folks here. I'm afraid I'm not going to cover that at all. Um, except in the sense of talking about PC free-to-play, like uh, League of Legends and the upcoming Hawken. Uh, by Adhesive and uh, Meteor. So there, there's some of this stuff is going to be applicable there. So uh, obviously we're going to touch a little bit on discovery. Everyone has very strong opinions about discovery. Uh, platform is a word that means multiple things uh, to uh, in, in different contexts. So I'm going to try and define what I mean by that when I get to it. And of course, core principles. What are the things that we hold dear? How do we make decisions on the games that we make, the games that we green light, the companies that we build, and what, what area they service, what markets they, they address? Uh, what, what is relevant in that, and, and what kind of is just uh, just filler. And then, of course, the question of maturity. Every, you know, there's, uh, there's this insistence to treat markets as becoming mature and then you know, moving on and seeing what else is there and kind of treating that as the next hot thing and then uh, abandoning that and moving on. So I guess you can guess what my opinion is on that subject. But uh, uh, those, those are the kind of the key topics that we're going to look at. So in terms of discovery, everyone is, yeah, this is, this is slow because I exported it from Keynote to PowerPoint. Um, CPI costs. Everyone talks about this going up, and then oh, uh, so uh, you know, we this is something that we don't can't really um, uh, handle. So we're just going to have to continue increasing our advertising costs. Our all of the all of this kind of cottage industry has come up of ad networks, everything about this. We all know this. This this is the way things are, or at least that's how we think about it. Uh, but and but we also discovered that there are ways around it, like editorial featuring. One of the things that we did at Funzio was we got every single Funzio game featured on every platform that it was released on this year, and that was a that was a very deliberate, distinct effort. It's something that is essential to uh, balancing out this rising CPI costs uh, aspect. But this this is kind of the the rubric where how most people actually see things. But there's all kinds of other things going on too. Um, I'd love to share with you the example of uh, uh, Dance Pad. Uh, um, which is a game that used uh, press and social media and partners in a relatively unique way. So uh, they had, uh, this is kind of a, a music dance game uh, that's specifically for iPad, 
And when it came out, very shortly after that, it was number one uh, on the iPad uh, free apps list. So uh, a music dance game, you know, occurs. I mean, every, obviously someone is number one at any given time. But the really interesting thing about this instance is that they did so without spending one cent on marketing. They did it entirely through their partnerships and through uh, social media. Now, granted, uh, uh, JLo was one of their partners, so may maybe this, this has some outlier aspects to it, but having the ability to create something that reaches uh, the public consciousness beyond just raw advertising has significant weight. Um, and then, of course, building on the CPI aspect, you know, there's new discovery apps coming on, there are player networks, which are also, you know, sometimes defined. Uh, offer an exchange, you know, um, a rev share, uh, control over the um, uh, user information, but you do definitely get up there in, in the ranks. And as far as, as, far as uh, uh, iOS and Android, uh, Google Play are concerned, you do have to rank. It is something that's necessary for you to survive, to get that visibility. It's all very well and good to say that um, if you spend money on advertising, it doesn't really show the value of the company. But if you don't do that, if you don't actually uh, figure out a way to rank, then you're not going to get noticed at all. You're not going to have uh, a chance to have your um, uh, monetization click in. So the other, another really interesting example that uh, I, I don't think gets uh, much attention is creative marketing. We in the game industry, I think, are not terrifically awesome at direct marketing. Uh, you see, uh, in, in my example of this is actually not a game at all. It's an app called AutoCAD WS, which um, uh, is now part of Autodesk, but it got there through a very interesting means. They, they were having trouble getting anyone to pay attention. They had no money to advertise it, uh, the startup that created this. And um, what they ended up doing was, was um, going back and paying very close attention to, so the other, another ritual skill set, which is in UI and engineering. So they created some very compelling stories about localization. Uh, for example, for the Italian version, they had, they had a bit about straightening the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which was really you know, uh, perfect for the audience. And uh, the CEO would uh, um, sometimes, well, a human would return all of their uh, uh, customer service calls within one hour, and including sometimes the CEO himself. And they would ask uh, the people whose problems they solved whether they would be interested in being involved in a marketing campaign about that. And they said, absolutely. And it was, it was something that helped drive kind of the community a very unique style of marketing to them. And uh, the final thing which, which I'm, I want to mention is, is something that we, we skip over so often in this industry at this conference, at all conferences, which is how good your game actually is. So word of mouth is, is the most powerful thing, and, we, and it, it's, it's, it's never even mentioned in this list. For me, in my head, word of mouth is actually the top thing. Uh, but there's very few ways to really convey that. A lot of what we're talking about here is, is very mechanical, uh, but what I want to get into in a little bit more detail is how to really ignite people emotionally in getting into your game. So platform, uh, this, in this page I'm defining it as an operating system. So what we, the main things where uh, a lot of people are talking about right now are iOS, Android, and starting to talk a little bit about Windows 8 because um, you know, several OEMs have been sitting out this uh, tablet war and uh, are expecting to have their product hit the market in, uh, at, at the end of this year. So uh, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about tablet being the next big thing or, or tablets that are just a little smaller but still have phone uh, functionality, uh, also known as phablets, uh, which I think is a hilarious word. Uh, we talk about these as either or. Most of us are like, okay, so we're going to just do iOS. And some people are now starting to do cross-platform iOS and Android. But one of the things that I always thought was sensible about Funzio's approach, and I don't really see that much anymore, is the idea of covering your bets, hedging your bets, being on all platforms or all reasonable platforms that are reasonable for you to be on. Uh, certainly, we're seeing more and more about, uh, 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 about technologies uh, um, middlewares that allow you to be on multiple platforms. Certainly Unity has always done this. But uh, the ability to actually have a game operate on multiple platforms, it's, it's, it's not a dream. I mean, it's not, it's not something that's only a dream. It's something that can be real. And uh, for me, I think this is, a, this is an, a trend that is absolutely worth fanning the flames of. But um, at the same time, having more new players or uh, familiar players uh, presenting themselves in new ways, like Microsoft with, with Windows 8, 
offers something new. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on what I think on that. When, when we look at platforms, if defined as digital shops. To me, this is the most important way to define a platform, is how you actually get your game, how, you, how, how the games uh, are presented in a market to players. Uh, people love to go and buy the games that they want uh, from familiar sources. Uh, in, in the brick and mortar world, of course, this was always you know, things like uh, uh, GameStop and, and, and Best Buy and things like that. Um, and certainly, as the digital market started to evolve, we saw XBLA, PlayStation Network, WiiWare, uh, and Steam, which were, of course, you know, places where PlayStation Network we was a safe and uh, uh, a great place to get quality software. Um, but uh, and I, but the, the problem with most of these, uh, with, with the three console ones that I mentioned here, is that they were so heavily curated that they had a very limited flow of content coming in. iTunes did it right. I mean, they had, of course, a massive amount, the massive music library, but there weren't any uh, games there yet. So uh, when, when we saw things like the iOS App Store and Android Google Play, uh, those were uh, extraordinarily uh, powerful for us. Um, but when people start looking at the Amazon App Store, in the beginning at least, th there was, I think, a lot of question about, well, what is, what is the prognosis for this? What are, what are the metrics on this? Uh, um, wh what is the distribution of Kindle Fires out in the universe? And um, uh, how do we know how, how well the best games are doing? Well, sometimes you just need to make a leap of faith. You need to be a first mover in an emerging market in order to claim that space. And that's something that uh, we took a risk on and put Crime City out on uh, Amazon App Store. And it was remarkably successful for, uh, for the market that it was in. And we're, we're just, uh, well, we, uh, Funzio is incredibly excited about seeing how that market develops. And then the, the point I wanted to make about the Windows 8 App Store is that there's a, an element of free-to-play thinking that's moving over to the arcade side, and that every app has, uh, has a free trial period for seven days, which is something I think they learned from their experiment with XBLA. Uh, well, the one thing I hope that they carry over, uh, the one thing I hope they don't carry over, is that all of the console uh, game uh, 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 shops never really promoted their game shop. So, you know, you saw these commercials for the PlayStation 3, it's the console that does everything, and they list all these things, Blu-ray player and all these other things, but they never actually mention the, P the PSN store. So apparently it does everything but actually have an app store, which seems to me would be the sexiest thing of, you know, about it uh, for, in terms of the longevity of the system that is you know, set four years ago, and uh, well, how, how, how does it continue to have relevance? Well, it has an active app store. So you know, in looking at all of these things, uh, one has to kind of take a step back and take a look at, you know, what are the things that we've always valued as, as, as criteria for making a successful game or a successful company? Uh, certainly metrics are the thing that are kind of the baseline, the absolute height requirement of, of fielding successful games and a successful game company. So we all have to have this locked down. Um, and, and of course, uh, you know, the idea of, of uh, user acquisition is kind of an essential thing. But, but uh, retention we need to think of that in, in ways more than simply uh, the kind of mechanics of, of the little uh, uh, kind of uh, levers that we can pull to enhance the game. Other things that we need to look at is why do people want to download a game? How, how do they make that decision in the first place? What is, what is hot and sexy today? Well, visual fidelity, I mean, it's a superficial thing to bring up, but I think it's very strong. It's something that really works in, in, how we, uh, uh, in, in terms of how we promote games today. And I, I think that's definitely something positive about the principles in, in, in effect today. Innovation, absolutely. I mean, it, it appears every now and then. Um, uh, but uh, I, I feel that in, when I'm on panels, it seems like when the question comes up, how do you, what is your strategy for innovation? And the answer that comes back pretty much from everybody else is, well, we keep an eye on our competition, and we just kind of keep an eye on them and see, how, uh, see what they're up to and, and make sure that uh, we're always one step ahead which seems completely counterintuitive and nonsensical. Uh, how do you stay ahead if you've got your eye on your competition? I'm not sure about that one. Um, the one thing that, that uh, the um, free-to-play, social, uh, virtual goods market does incredibly well is accessibility. This is something that is an important metric for us, I feel. It's something that gives us the ability to continuously provide great content to a wide amount of people, at least in, in terms of capturing them, at least in terms of getting their attention in the first place. Anytime we take a step back and look at something in terms of uh, complicating things back up to the console level, where you're handing someone a controller with 24 buttons, I think gets us back into 
a position that we don't want to be in. So I think that is a positive aspect. Monetization cliff is something that I've um, talked about a lot at uh, uh, after midnight over a few drinks with many of you in the audience. It's uh, the the concern I have about this is that if you if you set up the game so that in ten minutes you're basically requiring the player to put money in, or in seven days all of a sudden your castle is absolutely suddenly wide open to attack, something that you haven't been prepared for in the last seven days as you've been merrily building up your resources. I think that's a challenge. I think that's something that is exclusionary. It's something that uh, is perhaps exciting and fun for a kind of a hardcore competitive player, but absolutely runs the risk of, of losing the greater audience. So principles that I think should have some more uh, spotlight in, in what we talk about, skills. All, most of what we do in our games is uh, just kind of tap, is just kind of click. And uh, there's, there's very little to it beyond that. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have, we, we create, we, we kind of import over games that have like 60 minute tutorials and you have basically, uh, you have to figure out so many things that you need to do and look down and just, we don't want to overcomplicate things. But I, I love uh, the example of um, CSR racing where you, where you accelerate by just shifting, where you jump off the starting block by pressing at the right time. These, I think, are really interesting ways to introduce a very small amount of skill into the game and get people to enjoy it, even though it, you know, it, 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 has, it may not have the absolute um, uh, depth of play that so many classic console racers may have. So the idea of core, uh, the idea that something looks and feels like a core game, but, ha but is still accessible, I think is part of why this company works, uh, why this game works. And the company itself, Natural Motion, has this strong pedigree from the traditional game industry. So it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of DNA from there that makes a lot of sense to bring over. Also, let's, let's take a look at what's unique to the device. Uh, we're all excited about tablet. We're all excited about uh, touch devices. Um, we're starting to get excited about television and perhaps gesture, cameras uh, as, as interfaces. But what's missing from a lot of this is uh, bringing a sense of uniqueness to what you're doing with the device. It's something that Apple and all of the, all of the um, uh, manufacturers are very excited to see, but they don't see that much coming from developers that actually represent this. Uh, a game that was uh, incredibly popular recently is Draw Something. I'm still playing it uh, pretty much, it, I, it probably is the game I play the most right now, but it uses uh, skills unique to the device. It uses uh, uh, interfaces unique to the device where you are finger painting essentially, and what comes with that what comes with that is a sense of emotion. Um, Instagram was sold for a ridiculous amount of money, but was it, I'm not, I, I'm not sure that it was necessarily unreasonable because it was an app that conveyed emotion between people. Photography is an extraordinary technology in that it captures moments. You know, when, when we take pictures together at, 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 late, at bars and we're all kind of hugging and we post them to Facebook and we tag each other, it's awesome. It is so much fun to do that. And we put weird little um, uh, filters on it, make us look like we're all kind of um, in the 1800s. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's fun and, and we all kind of connect and it's, it's, it's just an incredible thing. But we in the game industry, uh, you know, we've had this history of bonding over playing Pac-Man, you know, we're the ones that are supposed to be the masters of emotion. And I, I think we've almost ceded that territory by having a very flat type of experience. So uh, draw something I think is something that actually brings that sense of emotion back in. And that is uh, uh, something that comes when you have kind of the unique capabilities of games as well as the unique capabilities of devices. And so other people, of course, draw something is something that you play with another person. You anticipate seeing this, their, their drawing come back. And, uh, you know, there are things that work in other parts of the game industry, like World of Warcraft, getting together with your friends to, to kind of do a raid, and, and League of Legends. These are, these are incredibly powerful. Um, the only thing limiting them is that they're, uh, they're not as accessible to more people. Imagine, imagine if we had something that ignited the emotions of people to play together that was actually accessible for everyone to play together. That would be pretty awesome. And the bottom line in all of this is that all of this has to be fun. I am frequently astonished by how much our industry has kind of been overrun with the sense of, of PowerPoints. I know I'm presenting this on PowerPoint. Uh, give me a, a, a little bit of leeway to make this point. But, um, we spend 
hours of our staff's time creating these PowerPoints, explaining how these metrics are going. Now, of course, it's absolutely critical to have a sense of how your games are performing and be absolutely on top of it, be able to shift on the fly. But um, as you're looking at new games, as you're creating a game that, sh that, 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 uh, that you're pr uh, attempting to feel that market, it must be worthy of devotion. It must be something that ignites the passions of people. It must be something that stands the test of time. It has to be something that functions as a work of art. So in terms of maturity, I, a lot of the time I see, I see our market as flat land. And I'm not, that's not a critique of the art style. That has, that has more to do with the simplicity of the grind, of, of almost the, the cynicism of, of kind of the appointment-based mechanics. And uh, there's, there's a lot that, you know, it, certainly it works. I mean, I, I can't stand here and, and, and criticize the $22 billion that this market is uh, destined to make by 2015. But, what I can say is that the sense of crowding, the sense of gloom and doom, oh, we need to move on from this particular market, I think is a function of the fact that we are all fielding single-celled organisms. Now, granted, they're all very successful single-celled organisms, but there is opportunity on this planet for more. There is an opportunity to, I mean, we, you know, investors and a lot of people talk about the blue ocean, that, you know, that there's something else out there. There's something more for us to look at. There's something more for us to explore and, and kind of get into a completely open new area. Um, a, a little bit like, I, I think, um, you know, you see things like League of Legends and then Hawken. I mentioned those at the beginning. This is an attempt to bring some of the mechanics of, of, of uh, social free-to-play uh, and apply some of the logic and, and decades of knowledge of creating fun from the traditional game industry. So having put that all together, I would encourage us all to think less of blue ocean and more about green land. We need to crawl out of the ocean with our newly formed stubby little legs and occupy dry land and create games that stand the test of time and are worthy of devotion. And you know, as for me, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on everything. I'm, 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 I love this industry. It's something that uh, I've loved ever since I was a kid. Um, uh, uh, and just, I've just been staying in touch with the amazing people that make great games. Uh, uh, Julian Egebrecht in the audience here, uh, his studio made uh, Rogue Squadron, one of my favorite games of all time. And that was a game that was fun, okay? I want more games like that. And so, if, if, if you feel the same way, I, I would love to kind of talk to you after the session, uh, just get a sense of, of what you're trying to do. And I understand, you know, in today's marketplace, it's much easier to say, I'm doing a game that is basically uh, Farmville meets uh, Crime City. And it's easy to say something like that. It's easier perhaps to get funding, not that it's easy to get funding, uh, but it's easier to get going with something if you have, if you're just marginally, incrementally uh, innovating from where we are. Uh, if you're having uh, some thoughts about, about what a game or what a game company or what uh, a game technology that supports what the games may look like in two years. If you have ideas about that, I would encourage you to, um, you know, talk to me. Uh, I am uh, very interested and open to seeing ways to uh, help those games come to life. And uh, I'm taking on a role as uh, EIR for uh, Rick Thompson's Signia Ventures. And uh, should you have any interest in finding funding for your brilliant, fun idea, uh, please talk to me. Thank you. Oh, and if you want to get a hold of me, I'm on LinkedIn uh, uh, under my actual name. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have time for a couple of questions. OK. Questions? Anybody want to know how to get money out of Jamil? <laughs> yeah, it was perhaps a bit too intense. <laughs> you scared them all away. Yes. So, I, what is EIR? Entrepreneur oh, um, in Residence. Yes. <laughs> ah, got it. Hey, Jamil, uh, yes. you're only at Funzio for a little while. Uh, I'd love to hear, you know, what, what the transition was like from EA to a, to a true sort of freemium company, uh, even though it was a short period with a fantastic outcome for you. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, it was tough because I had a really fun job at EA. I think I had one of the best jobs there. I think me and Michael had the best jobs. And we had the chance to survey everything in the game industry and find ways to work with really great people uh, at our, at our uh, platform partners, partners like Sony. And it was, it was fun. 
But moving to Funzio was something that uh, illustrated how a company can move on a daily basis, how a company can focus on fun and deliver it on, on uh, a very quick clip, on a very quick cadence. And a company that, you know, th th there's also a very large difference between working at a large company, like I need to actually clarify this point, but working at a large company and then working at a startup where you're, you are your own boss, you're, you're calling your own shots. And uh, having the opportunity to help raise that company uh, uh, was, was just deeply satisfying. Uh, having that sense of autonomy versus being one among many in a kind of a cubicle situation, it makes a big difference on the soul. Thank you very much. Oh, oh wait, we got one more. Uh, yeah, of course, I can project. I know. <laughs> uh, you were talking about the idea of uh, building more longevity into games and, and, yes. and looking forward. I, it seems that with technology turning over so quickly and new platforms, that, that becomes more challenging. I mean, do you think that's more about creating brands that have like gaming hooks and handles that can, you know, sort of that uh, you, you can revisit as your, as your game technology advances? I'm so glad you asked that question. I, I, I actually made that point in my rehearsals and I forgot to make it this time, thank you. Um, so um, platforms are secondary. I, I should have actually written that on there so I'd remember to say that. Uh, your games are primary. Your games, your IP that you create, your experiences that you create should function independent of platform. Certainly they should take advantage of the unique capabilities and input systems of those platforms, but people want to play Angry Birds. They don't necessarily, it's not, it's not the platform that they're devoted to. And uh, Angry Birds is a great example of using the platform too, because it's not a click game. You pull back your bird and fire it off. So they figured out something really brilliant. So it's not just kind of the traditional game industry, but the arcade half. Of, of, of the game industry that uh, free-to-play can learn from. So yes, I think longevity is absolutely tied to creating a great game experience that, is pot that, is, that can potentially transcend the platform. Any other questions for Jamil? Great, thank you very much and good luck in your next venture. Thank you. It really was a split second, wasn't it? <laughs>